Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to this very special episode of the Canadian Bowler Podcast. As always, I'm your host, Luke Caldwell, and I have my two boys here, Mr. Michael and Mr. Daryl. How are you guys doing today? Pretty fantastic. How are you doing, Luke? Oh, I'm just wonderful. I just can't believe that we hit 1,000 subs a little early of our goal, and it's Thanksgiving. Happy Thanksgiving, everybody out there in Canada. Happy Thanksgiving. Yeah, I guess we know what we're thankful this year, or what we're thankful <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, bit of a bit of a surprise. We we set an end of the goal year and to to hit that in October, we're not gonna complain, I don't think, one bit. How are you guys feeling about it? That's pretty pretty incredible. I mean, again, I we talk about it all the time. It's something that we never really expected to actually go anywhere. Just a passion project and we brought you in, Mike, and you helped us out a lot to get us to that number. So thank you. Daryl puts in a lot of hard work, so I think we gotta tip our caps to Daryl because Daryl probably puts in more more hours than anybody on this so thank you daryl and thanks to all of our loyal and wonderful fans that we have out there who show up every other week and watch all of our stuff and uh we really do appreciate it i mean i'm sure i can speak for all of us on that one yeah uh i'm i'm blown away the uh you guys might not know but um for myself and now for uh for michael as well we're analytics guys so we like looking at all the numbers behind the scenes you know who's watching the videos uh you know what countries and all that um just to see the growth in the last two months i'd say uh has been unbelievable um our growth has gone um way above and beyond what we expected we were hoping to you know, keep chugging away until the end of the year and, and then hopefully hit that thousand uh, sub goal. But we've done it now and we're, we're past that now and we're, we're still running really well. So it's just, um, it's just awesome. Yeah. I think currently as it stands, when we started the show around 1010, I'm not, I don't know the exact number, but I think for me, it says 1.01 thousand so whatever that actually works out to in youtube terms it could be a little more a little less who knows but um i guess before we get too deep into the show we should probably cover some housekeeping um everybody make sure to like subscribe comment all that stuff in down below um if don't forget if you can't be here for the full podcast today we're always available on all major podcast platforms including apple Podcasts and spotify being those major ones uh we actually had a lot of downloads on those i think we might be over a thousand downloads on the podcast too so uh, thanks to everybody who downloads those. Those uh, are big numbers for us, too. We appreciate that. Um, don't forget to hit the notification bell down there as well. That tells you every time a new video gets posted on our channel or anything goes live, including this podcast. Um, and I think that's pretty much it. Uh, I guess uh, with that notification bell, you can be expecting a few more things coming down the pipeline from the Canadian Bowler here shortly. Um, I'll let Daryl uh, start that one off. And let, Well, Daryl, what do you got coming up in the next, uh, I don't know, next uh, couple hours <laughs> yeah uh at about one o'clock uh eastern daylight time we will be releasing the final video in that delivery series on technical difficulties so we're talking about um the delivery movement and we're talking about the release and a little bonus content on uh, the follow-through as well so we're um third video in the series we're wrapping up that fundamental um how do i deliver a bull from start to finish and hopefully um, we'll have a, a few more supplementary videos on delivery as well. Just how do you do adjustments and, you know, how do you change your weight and do things like that. But, um, check out that new video. It'll be dropping at one o'clock our time, Ontario time. Um, I know people have been asking, when are you going to drop it? When, when is it coming out? Uh, some people have been really anxious, uh, to get that. So, um, yeah. Yeah, there's definitely been a lot of hype around it and the videos have done really well so it's pretty awesome to see and uh, obviously people like the the coaching stuff that you guys do we are glad to see that um i don't know if you're ready to talk about it yet mike but uh, are you ready to talk about it <laughs> what, what what aspect are you uh, referring to there's lots of things that i could talk about i'll go ahead you talk it's your it's your uh, your big day my big day. Uh, well, I do have my own series that eventually is going to come out. Uh, I've started filming process, going to go more into the equipment of Lawn Bowls, so pretty much called the Equipment Shack. So I'm going to take you to my little Equipment Shack, and we're going to go through the different equipment that you use in Bowls, how you can better utilize it to be a better player. So that's uh, something that's going to be coming down the pipe eventually. Um, 
working on it at this point, editing and getting video together. So hopefully you'll see that sometime in maybe the next month or month or two here. Um, and beyond that, I think we've got a couple other ideas we've all been throwing around with Luke's got his own little passion project I think he's starting to work on. And then there's another idea that I have that I think we're going to probably be releasing sometime here in the next month or two. So over the winter, we'll have some new stuff to uh, keep you entertained and keep you interested in bulls while you're maybe having a winter for, I guess, what the northern hemisphere of the world. So, yeah. Yeah, uh, we do appreciate all the, the comments we get on asking when things are going to come out. Uh, it really does uh, make us want to make those videos and get them out. But uh, we say this every time. you got to remember, it's just three idiots who don't know what we're doing, uh, <laughs> trying to edit videos and get them posted out there. So we're doing our best, and we try to get them out as timely as possible. But sometimes things get delayed. I know we talk a lot of smack on here, and things don't happen. But things are coming. you just got to kind of be patient. Yeah, it's been really tough with... Um with all the lockdowns going around, uh, COVID spiking here and there and, and clubs not being necessarily open, um, all the time. I know personally trying to get that last video out, um, the weather here in Ontario has been, uh, pretty wet and rainy and, um, just trying to find that day where I can go out and film is crazy. Mike knows this now and Luke, you'll find this, uh, eventually, but, um, going out for a day filming for a couple hours to get, let's say an hour and a half of video and then trimming that down to like a 10 minute video, it's difficult. And, uh, the amount of takes and retakes and swearing and, you know, wondering what am I talking about or why did I fumble here and, and getting frustrated? Uh, it happens and we're not professionals, so it, it gets to us a little bit more. So, um, we are really, really happy that you enjoy the content. Always make sure if you, if you like the video, make sure you like it. If you, have questions on the video comment in the uh, in the comment section we read all those comments we we see all those likes and if you really really like something we'll, it'll just make us want to do more of that stuff for you and if you have questions that might drive another video to to answer some of your questions as well and i think a big one uh, for us is if uh say if it's a coaching video and you think it was helpful don't be afraid to share that out on facebook or share it to your friends or your parents or kids whatever uh those things go a long way for us and uh like we said always we appreciate it all well i guess we we got quite a jam-packed show of everything we want to cover today so we might as well get into some of the content here so first one i think we were going to touch on was we ran a little bit of an impromptu bulls survey uh figuring out <laughs> what was the best type of bowl to use on uh, our facebook page over the last little while so i think daryl's got those uh results tabulated over there i do so uh made a, a main post on our channel and then we shared it out to a couple of the bigger lumbles groups just to get uh, some feedback and based on those results it was it was quite interesting to get um 42 percent of the people who responded with um, a like, uh, liked arrow bowls. Um, so that was 150 out of uh, 353 uh, responses. Uh, Green Master was 2%. Um, I actually don't know anybody that uses Green Master, um, or at least uses it regularly. They may have a set, but um, that was only really popular in, um, I think it was the UK, um, was the bulk of it. Uh, Taylor uh, had 91 responses, which is 26%. Uh, Drake's Pride had uh, 28 uh, responses, which was 8%. And then uh, Hence Light had 76, which was 22%. So a kind of a, a nice split between Taylor and Hence Light, which is not um, surprising. And then there was only one other. So out of all those brands, something that wasn't part of those brands, uh, one person responded that they used something completely different than... Um, I guess what we we could call the uh, the top five brands that we would think of. Do you guys uh, think the results were like surprising at all? Or are you shocked that Arrow was number one and Taylor was number two, so on and so forth? What do you guys think? Like for me, I, I would say I'm I was a little surprised when Daryl told me that Arrow won by like not even a small margin really either. Like it was pretty pretty substantial that Arrow won there. And in Canada, for me, I don't see it as much. I, I think I told you guys this when we talked in the past, but Arrow Bowls specifically in Saskatchewan, where I'm from, there's literally probably like two people that have a set of Arrow Bowls. So it, they're not common at all here. We don't have someone who sells them out here. So I think that's probably why 
it's a little surprising for me where I know in other provinces, arrow bowls are pretty prevalent and they're quite popular. So maybe it's just the fact that Saskatchewan, we don't have much for arrow bowls, but then it's those other provinces. And then I think the demographics from Australia and uh, specifically maybe the UK, there's a little bit more of a, an arrow bowls presence. So I guess it shouldn't really surprise me, but yeah. Um, if I look at Australia, um, arrow was a huge one they almost had 100 responses out of uh out of the 150 that arrow had total um Henslite and taylor in australia had almost an even split of 52 51. um it, it wasn't super surprising um i guess here in canada i tend to see a lot more taylor and, and Henslite in a general sense but arrow um is all over the place and i see a ton of them now and more and more every year um it's it's one of those brands that's taken off now uh i don't have a problem with any brand um as long as it's a good bowl for you something that you're comfortable with you like the the bias that it, it gives you use the bowl that you like um i wouldn't tell you that you know you shouldn't use green master you shouldn't use taylor you should use Henslate. but there are plenty of people that have very strong opinions um either for or against uh, those kind of things yeah, like you definitely get uh, the people that are pretty opinionated on their bowls brands and which one they want to use. So I actually enjoyed seeing the post though. And as you're saying, we got some Green Master and we got some Drake's Pride in there as well because that'll actually throw some uh, interesting takes on what people choose because I've used all the different types of bowls except for Arrow myself. So uh, it was fun. It was a good, good little poll you did there. Yeah, well, it was kind of fun. So um, we'll be trying to throw out some of those um, from time to time. Um, we may do like, you know, hey, what's your favorite type of color or what's your favorite uh, um, brand in Henslate or whatever it is. Um, they're really, really neat to see. And uh, of course, they're they're unofficial. And uh, uh, we try to throw them out to as many people as we can. But uh, I found it kind of neat just to see what was out there. Yeah. Um... So I think Luke's got some technical problems there, so I'm not sure if he's going to be participating in this conversation. Do you have your audio figured out, Luke, yet? No? He'll probably give us a thumbs up later. Okay. I guess we can sort of transition to our other stuff we got to talk about. Um, so like I guess the one thing we wanted to talk about, we've got like a bunch of Bulls news that really came out in the last couple weeks like we have sort of a chat that the three of us have and i think daryl and me have each been sharing articles pretty much every second day or every day here so like uh the first one we had from about two weeks ago was about uh hamilton ontario and the 2030 bidding for the commonwealth games so they essentially fell out of it uh, a couple of years back essentially almost withdrew there their bid and then it sounds like as of just uh, about a week ago there that they're actually in the process of submitting or reviving that bid for 2030 in Hamilton Ontario so what do you think about that Daryl that's really interesting um I'm I'm excited I I've always wanted Canada to have another Commonwealth Games um not necessarily in a province that already has a four green um uh, club but someone that may benefit from it. Um, Ontario doesn't have uh, that. So having one in Ontario would be awesome. Um, build up the infrastructure. Hamilton is, you know, pretty close to Toronto, kind of in that uh, um, hub that you would say um, in our area of, uh, you know, a lot of people. Um, it, it, I, I want that kind of legacy money in, in bowls and um, build up some... <laughs> build up some... Um, facilities and you know maybe ramp up their greens and and do all that kind of stuff um i think it's really exciting um i know commonwealth games and spending that kind of money on sport isn't in um you know everybody's you know quote unquote i love uh this kind of stuff but i i think it would be really exciting yeah like for me i think it'd be pretty incredible to actually have a commonwealth games in canada because like if i'm doing it off memory i don't think there's been one in my lifetime like uh i think the last one we hosted in canada was maybe 94 or yeah. something like that when it was in victoria maybe i think that's right so yeah. that's i guess that's technically actually my lifetime so um but yeah very long time ago even and those legacy facilities are huge because you look at it uh juan de fuca 
is where that was hosted. They still use that facility. It's still one of the best facilities in Canada. And then if you look at Edmonton, they hosted the Commonwealth Games in I think it was about 1980 or 1981, something like that. And they still use Commonwealth Lawn Bowling Club as probably one of their premier facilities too. So it's definitely a legacy facility. It would be big for the sport if we do get it in Hamilton. Uh, you sort of highlighted the place that you think could potentially be the facility. There's a couple of places in Hamilton that I know have bowls facilities already and probably could be expanded upon pretty easily. But it would be huge news for the, the game in Canada if we do get it. And Hamilton does sort of have that ability to maybe expand, as you're saying. Yeah, there's uh, a bowling club in, I think it's Gage Park in Hamilton uh, called Rose Lawn Lumbling Club. Um, clubhouse is really old. It's really kind of cool. It would it would um, be really neat to see that get kind of a, a refreshing and, a, um, you know, get some stuff fixed up, you know, fresh coat of paint, all that kind of stuff. Uh, the greens are, and no offense to the people in Hamilton, the greens are not that good. <laughs> I've been there a few times. Uh, they tend to be slow. They tend to be a little um, iffy, and the the backboards are a little iffy as well. Um, but it, I think it would it would be awesome if that club got kind of of uh, revitalization, so to speak. Um, got some of that money dumped in and and took over a chunk of that park and and really made it um, an awesome venue. And Burlington, uh, which we were at for the Phoenix Bulls championship, is literally minutes away. Um, down the highway from from that area, so it's really close. They could get support from a really great club, um, and the greenskeeper at uh, Burlington is awesome too. So I mean, they've got a lot of resources right in that area. Yeah, no, it would be encouraging if it's something that actually goes through. So we'll have to keep our eyes peeled for whatever happens in the deliberation process in the next little while. Um. I guess we can, do you want to move on to our next topic then? I guess we'll just keep firing them through because we do have quite a bit of stuff today. <laughs> yeah, um, sure. Yeah, let's keep going. Next one, I guess, that we had, I have here on our list is talking about Bulls Australia and the Olympics. So another sort of development uh, in that whole saga. So I, we touched on at the show probably a couple months back about how um, Bulls Australia, well, I guess Australia was awarded the Olympic Games for what years is it 2030 as well something like that i'm trying even to think of regardless they were awarded the the olympics uh it's in the gold coast area 2032 so they, 2032 so they were awarded the olympics and then pretty much what's happening now is they've made a lot of statements and official press releases about how they're going to push heavily to try and get lawn bowls included as one of the sports essentially when you host the olympics uh the host country can essentially pick a certain amount of events that they want included in their Olympic Games. So it makes complete sense for Australia to try and get lawn bowls in the Olympics because that's probably going to get them a, a few medals over the male and female disciplines. So a little interesting to see their, their releases about that. And I think World Bowls even came out and said that they're uh, going to be in support of this and really pushing as hard as they can for it too, which... Again, kind of seems like an obvious thing if you can get lawn bowls in the Olympics, even if it's kind of under a, a I call it a backdoor method, because I think we've had a couple of discussions, me and you, about this, where I see it as you're kind of getting, taking advantage of the fact that you're hosting the Olympics, but we're not really fixing the background problems of how for the last 20 years they've tried to get lawn bowling into the Olympics and they've never really done the development side worldwide that we need to actually be considered for other countries that aren't Australian hosting the Olympics. Yeah. Um, what's your take on that, Daryl? I think it's a really interesting concept. I know um, there's been debate um, ever since World Bowls kind of dropped the, the notion that they're they're trying to get um, long bowls into the Olympics. They, they kind of started that whole process. Um, this is kind of a, um, another, I guess, backdoor way into it. Um, have a host country that actually wants to push bowls into it. Um, I think there's a, yeah, there's a lot of problems. Um, you can see it at the Commonwealth Games. Um, I think, you know, there's not a lot of TV coverage. It's long games, uh, format issues. Um, bowls are multicolored all over the place. So, you know, trying to standardize that. There's a, there's a ton of issues that I think need to be ironed out and I think would benefit bowls overall to have those ironed out. Um, and this might just give you the opportunity to have that big push to say, you know what, we know there's issues, 
we know there's things going on but let's just get at it and uh and be ready for 2032 luke back made it he's back <laughs> i have no idea what happened i'm really sorry um my headphones literally just decided to die like they quit i couldn't figure out why and so I had to restart my computer, reinstall the software, and then wow. they were really loud, and I almost broke my eardrums. But we're good. We're back. <laughs> um, yeah. It sucks because right when it went off, I had a really good point to say, but it's, it's garbage now. So. <laughs> Sorry, guys. No, no problem. problem. Did, you want, did you want to add anything to our conversation about Olympics and bowls being included? Uh, I did actually catch a little bit of it because I was testing some audio stuff and I had it up on the YouTube page. Um, mm -hmm. I, I, I think I, I agree with what Mike said. I think it would be a, a good thing for obviously a good thing for bowls to be in the Olympics. But um, I think it uh, kind of similar to what you said. I think it just kind of puts a bandaid on a lot of things um, and seeing like it doesn't really I don't think it really helps the sport grow in other countries other than Australia. It's kind of like how. Um, Commonwealth Games perform their lawn bowling in the Commonwealth Games perform perform so well in Australia, but does it perform that well anywhere else? Probably not. Um, unfortunately, um, I mean, I don't think it's a bad thing though. Yeah, so, no, it's. Go ahead, Daryl. I was just gonna say there's there's one really interesting thing that came out of this. Um, so uh, Bulls Australia dropped the news. Um, I don't know if any other country or if World Bulls has dropped the news yet, but. Um, there's a an Olympics advisory board or group that was formed. Um, so it's Neil Delrymple from uh, Bulls Australia. He's the CEO. He's the chair of this group. There's the World Bulls president, Daryl Clout, World Bulls CEO, Gary Smith, um, International Bulls for the Disabled president, Paul Brown, um, athlete representative, Lindsay Clark from Australia, and then a couple member nation representatives, uh, Bulls New Zealand CEO, Mark Cameron. And... Our very own CEO, Anamese, is on that uh, that group to actually look and figure out exactly how they do it and how they possibly may change the format and um, and how things look um, to make it fit into Olympics and hopefully carry that forward to, to make some actual positive change in, in bowls worldwide. The only thing that... Um... I kind of struggled to see, and obviously there's more money in the Olympics than a lot of other um, major sport competitions, such as like Pan Am Games and Commonwealth Games. But um, unfortunately, it always seems that uh, Lombos fails and all of these things. Like um, we spoke about it on a previous show about how um, they're talking about having Lombos be removed from the Commonwealth Games simply because it costs too much money. Um, again, and again, I realize there's a lot more money in the Olympics, but if it can't succeed in some of the uh, lesser uh, known things, why would it survive in the Olympics? It's a really good yeah, question. That, it's a completely valid point, and that kind of leads back to me. Like, if someone wanted to come on the show and have a spirited debate with me, I think we'd have probably the polls of positive and negative about how we feel about it being included in the Olympics and my perspective I think if we got the go-ahead that it's going to be part of the Olympics that could be important for the development of the sport um, they could really take that and probably with a few years run with it and maybe develop it in some countries that don't have representation or maybe get sort of that Olympic money if we're going to call it that and maybe develop bowls in some countries that maybe just have a very small following or maybe one club type of a thing so my perspective I'd hope that that's kind of what would happen if we do and then maybe we just really put everything into developing it and kind of trying to keep it at the level of maybe staying in the Olympics, but I think there's a lot of work that hasn't been done and needs to be done for something like that to happen. Yeah, I think there's plenty of countries that could benefit from it, or at least benefit from some development uh, money being thrown into it. Um, I'm not, I don't have a concern with like the UK and Australia and New Zealand. Um, they have their own infrastructure, they have money in there that they can um, do some stuff. Um, Canada is at the, I would say at the base of the top part of, uh, bulls, you know, those big countries that have stuff going on. Canada is kind of right in that middle ground. It's everybody below. Um, I think, you know, bulls USA could benefit from it. Um, South America has a couple of countries that have bulls that could really benefit from just development, having, um, people take a look at what they're doing and, and try to grow the sport there. Um, Europe. Um, try to 
grow some of those really small countries, even those that are around um, Australia, like Cook Islands, um, uh, Norfolk Island, um, those kind of countries that uh, I think they could grow and and see their programs do a lot better and um, just bring globally a little more um, eyeballs to the sport. I think so too, and um, I know what I know here in Canada, um, we have a lot of uh, issues financially in the sport of lawn bowls. Um, I'm sure you guys can all speak on it, myself included. Um, it's just it costs a lot of money to be a high performance athlete in the sport. Um, unfortunately, there's a lot of things that you have to pay for out of your own pocket just because simply there's not there's no funding or not enough funding. I mean, I know from speaking with our uh, Athletes Canada representative, uh, Rob Law, I know it is possible for uh, Canadian lawn bowlers to become carded athletes now and uh, qualify for grants such as like Quest for Gold and basically um, just funding to train and uh, travel and compete. So I think that's cool. I also think uh, if the Olympics did happen, that would probably open up in more countries um, with being carded athletes um, and whatever else just for funding for um basically personal use um, for time away from work and time away from home and uh, time to train and everything else because it all adds up. It's very expensive uh, to travel to Australia. Um, like, you got to think about it. If you're going to go to the Commonwealth Games, you're gone for what, Daryl, five or six weeks uh, as an athlete? Probably uh, three to four, depending on how much time you take uh, ahead and after. Yeah. yeah, but even still, three to four weeks away from work. And then on top of that, you have to think, if you're a national team athlete, you're supposed to be trying or competing at a national championship. That's another, at least another week off work, um, assuming that all works out. And then if you have to go to a training camp, there's another week off work. Uh, so now you're up to almost 10 weeks off work in a year, which is pretty insane unless you have a pretty sweet job where you're getting lots of holiday time. So I guess if you look at it from that end, I think that getting the Olympics in could be helpful. Yeah, no, it, it will be an interesting process here over the next, what, decade, I guess, that we're going to probably have this figured out and see what happens. The, the one thing I'm interested to see would happen is in the Olympics, the UK controls all of its sort of nations that are, I guess, not considered Olympic nations. So I would love to see what will happen with if we host or be part of the Olympics, because good luck picking a UK team where... England, Scotland, uh, Northern Ireland, essentially all these yes. other countries would be considered under one. Like, good luck picking that one Commonwealth or, sorry, I guess, uh, Olympic team. So I think that'd be a pretty interesting, and that's also another problem with Olympics and bowls because you're going to have a lot of countries that don't get recognized as Olympic nations, essentially cut out of uh, being able to even be part of it or part of that sort of the lawn bowls world. So lots of stuff to figure out in the next decade. That's similar to even the Commonwealth Games too, though, Mike. There's a lot of countries that are very competitive in bowls and have a decent presence and just don't compete because they're not a Commonwealth country. So, yeah, I yeah. mean, I guess it's similar. Well, I think we've pretty much exhausted that topic. Um, we've got a couple other ones. Very busy show here. Um, I guess, Daryl, you, you did go through. We have your video dropping. I think it's two hours from now, correct? Yeah, one o'clock. Um, so in an hour and a half, you will see our next technical difficulties video drop um, on the last part of the delivery. Um, go check that out. Check out the first two videos um, in the techni uh, technical difficulties delivery series. Um, don't forget to like, comment. Let us know what you think of them. If you if you have comments, um, discussion, debate on, on what you think uh, a good delivery is. You know, stick it in the comments. We we read all the comments. We want to make the show better. We want to drop more videos um, answering some of your questions. So um, we love that interaction. So go check that out and, uh, and let us know what you think. Perfect. Um, so I guess one of the other aspects of news we wanted to cover was the world indoor is having fans again. So Potter's... Uh, guess we're gonna have that event coming up here in the next few months they're gonna have fans again so kind of an interesting development to i guess have fans back at a sporting event again but i guess it's probably important for an event like that where they do get a decent amount of fanfare so what do you guys think about uh, potters having the fans back 
Uh, personally, I think it's a must at this point, um, just because simply if you look at every other sport, like we watched boxing last night and there was how many thousands of tens of thousands of people in attendance. I realize it's in America and they do things a little different than the rest of the world, um, whether that's a good thing or bad thing. But even here in Canada, I know I read an article the other day that uh, the Toronto Maple Leafs and the Toronto Raptors will be able to have full capacity for regular season games coming up. Um, so, I mean, as vaccination percentages rise i don't think there's reasons why we can't have these things uh, i guess it just kind of comes down to whether uh, the spectator themselves feel safe doing something like that and but i guess that's it but it's no different because everyone goes to the grocery store and everyone does all this stuff so uh but yeah i think it's a must just because if they're going to keep up with everything else at this point i think they kind of need it yeah, i can agree with that yeah. I, yeah. I think no, um it's it's still for me it's still odd to see huge crowds like uh, Luke was saying, watching um, the big boxing match last night, um, Tyson Fury and, and Wilder, just seeing the amount of people that were in the T-Mobile arena to watch that uh, was insane. Um, I couldn't imagine being at something like that myself, but there's plenty of people I know that are just itching to go out and, you know, see their favorite band or, um, you know, go to the, the Toronto Maple Leafs, uh, you know, games and stuff like that. So, it's definitely something that is coming, and um, I don't see a problem with it as as long as they're doing everything that they can to keep people safe. Um, I don't see a problem. I will say the only thing that I think is interesting um, with uh, whether it be this or not, I don't know. Obviously, we don't know how they're going to run the spectators, whether it's full capacity, half capacity, or whatever. Um, I think it's interesting uh, with the events that are full capacity, even here in Canada, because I know... It's all about money, obviously. Like teams are trying to recuperate money. Teams like the Toronto Maple Leafs, who are probably hemorrhaged money over the last two years, as compared to uh, the recent years, because they're so so popular and so expensive. Um, I do think it's interesting that they're going to be sitting people shoulder to shoulder in full capacity, not even giving people the option. Like I know over this past uh, couple months at the, with the Blue Jays, they're pretty hype. And I actually happened to look up to, to thinking about getting tickets and you had the choice to sit socially distance or not. So I thought that was a, a great idea. But obviously those things probably are going to be kind of disappear here if things are full capacity. Yeah, I think it probably would come down to the stadium size too, because if we're talking for about sure. Sky Dome, you got a what sixty thousand, yeah, yeah. So you got a big facility that you can spread thirty thousand seats or whatever they were allowing in there, and if you're allowing full capacity, obviously, a bit of a difference. Part of me thinks that what they'll do in England there is, I'm imagining it's going to be either socially distanced or you'd have some sort of a capacity limit type of a thing. Um, on the the spectators they do have but again probably get more updates or we'll actually see what's actually going to happen when they they start having some video coverage of the event coming out there yeah it'll be interesting to see um obviously the demographic skews higher than most other sporting events and concerts and stuff that are going on so um it, yeah uh whatever's happening i'm sure we'll we'll get to see it and uh hopefully everybody stays safe and is healthy and and things go off without a hitch. That's our that's our hope anyway. Okay. Um, our last bit of news, I guess, that we have sort of lined up was, I guess, resignations from national teams and yeah. tons of just news galore. I'll let you sort of take those over, Daryl, because you, you sort of seem to be a little more <laughs> into it than I am. Um, yeah, some some big news. Uh, we missed one a little earlier, but um, a lot of stuff going on with national teams. So uh, one that happened uh, probably about a month ago, um, David Gurley uh, from Bowl Scotland stepped down as a high-performance uh, coach. Um, I think the, the reasons that were cited were um, the fact, I mean, he lives in Spain. He doesn't live in the UK and travel and stuff has been really, really difficult. Uh, he felt he just couldn't do the job well enough uh, for the team, so he's kind of stepped away, um, which is huge because uh, he's been such a mainstay as a part of that team um, as their coach. Um, but in line with that, Ellen Faulkner, um, a huge part of Bulls England uh, women's side, has uh, stepped away from the national team, and she's uh, I think she's moving to Australia to take up a position as... Um, uh, overseeing their their parable side, which is really really neat, and uh, Aaron Sheriff, 
uh, stepping away from the um, jackaroos in Australia. That's a, another huge one. So like some really, really key players and key people on um, national teams across the world have, have stepped away. I always think it's exciting to see stuff like that. I mean, obviously, uh, people like the, especially Aaron Sheriff and those guys have all had uh, pretty celebrated careers in the sport. But I, uh, I said it before when we talked about the, the Joe Edwards retirement. It's just exciting to watch to see who's going to be that next person to fill those shoes. Uh, maybe the next superstar, who knows, especially coming out of countries like Australia, England, Scotland. I mean, I guess David's is a little different with a coach, but still give somebody a great opportunity to shine in a, in a new light. And I think that's always exciting. Yeah, like you're pretty much talking about three of the probably the top five Bulls nations in the world. They're all having pretty significant people kind of step out of the picture. So I agree with you completely, Luke. It's going to be a little exciting to see what will actually happen with those different programs, see who's going to be that fill in for uh, Faulkner and Team England squad. Definitely lots of people that you could think about. And it'd be interesting to see what happens with that. And then same thing with Sheriff, where you're essentially getting the skip of the fours and triples team traditionally just gone from that roster. So lots of people to jump in, but then it'll be interesting to see what their makeup is, what the lineup actually gets selected for. I guess the next major one would be comp games coming up there. So, yeah, pretty big news over the last little while here. There's, uh, there's going to be some, I mean, maybe not in... Um the near future but down the road there's going to be some some big changes that will happen when certain key players step away um thinking about like bowl scotland has had that core of um darren burnett alex marshall and paul foster for as long as i can remember and uh their mainstays like everybody just assumes that they're going to be on the team um they're going to play you know pairs and fours together and all that kind of stuff uh when one or both of those guys step away um down the road uh those are going to be some hefty hefty shoes to fill yeah yeah it's probably something that's kind of conceivably happening fairly soon too because like as you're saying they've been around for a very long time and i think there probably comes a point when you get maybe into that 50s range for a bowler that you maybe start to think about relaxing it back or maybe not playing as competitively anymore so could be could be happening fairly soon could be seeing lots of news like this where there's kind of that flux in and out on the national teams yeah it's just uh sorry go ahead no go ahead no no you're good i was just gonna say i i think um the pandemic and the break has really um had people kind of step back and reassess what they're doing um i know uh i've done it with work and and with this program and and what i'm doing at the house um, it just gives you that that kind of break where nothing's going on. There's no competition, and you kind of have that assessment to say, you know, do I really want to keep doing this? What's my age? What am I going to be doing when I come back? Um, travel, whatever it is, um, it can really make you change your mind because we've had a significant break. Absolutely, and I guess uh, just talking about uh, some of the future stars coming up, I did want to reel this back into something a little more local, and uh, we did have the announcement of the uh, Youth Championships uh, location here in Canada, and uh, we actually had a little bit of a conversation on this uh, the other day, and I just wanted to briefly touch on it. Um, it's being held at uh, Port Credit Lawn Bowling Club and split with the, it'll be James Gardens Lawn Bowling Club. Um, I think the interesting topic to talk about is um, how they're hosting it. I think somebody said that the, all the finals will be at Port Credit Lawn Bowling Club, which is a, uh, a grass green, and James Gardens is an artificial green. Um, I think that's different switching um, that for a final match, but uh, hey, that's just a thought. How do you guys think? Um, I know the, the news article came out uh, on the first of this month um, that they're going to do that. I don't, I don't think they've officially put down a schedule or what they're going to do, but um, uh, it's quite a drastic split between what James Gardens is and runs at in their surface versus Port Credit. Um, if they do have to switch at all, um, that's going to be crazy. I will say I do want to give a lot of credit to both those clubs, and it's pretty hard to talk shit um, regardless of what I think about 
surfaces or whatever because a lot of people aren't trying to host things we've again we've talked about that in the past True. so i mean i i'd say it is great that those clubs are willing to do it and put their names forward so uh, a lot of credit given to them but i'm, I'm just really curious to see how it's going to go yeah like i i don't want to be overly critical of the club stepping up to host the events because we've talked about it a couple times on the show here that we're having problems finding places to even take events at this point and yeah. sort of step up and take that leap that they need to take. So I don't want to come off as critical, but I really don't like the decision at all. I, I think it's quite foolish to have a 15 second artificial green for one of your greens and then have, I'm going to be generous and say an 11 second outdoor Fort, grass green. Fort credit's pretty solid. But so there we go, even 11, 12 second outdoor green 15 second artificial so pretty drastic change there specifically if we're talking about the youth uh you're gonna get a lot of very inexperienced players maybe someone who's never played at nationals before and if they have to do some sort of a switch or go back and forth i think it's going to be pretty detrimental to a lot of the younger players um specifically if you're for maybe it's your first nationals maybe your first second year bowling to have a green speed like that 15 seconds maybe an artificial you maybe probably have never played anything even close to that like i know for me from saskatchewan we're lucky if our greens get to 10 11 seconds so if i've only ever played on a 10 or 11 second green and then i suddenly show up in toronto with my hensel like classics and i'm playing <laughs> on a 15 second artificial my bowl's going to be going sideways so it's a whole different world um, it's going to add a whole different layer of complexity and challenge to the the children that are essentially going to be part of this game. But again, good on them for stepping up to do it. Excited to see what they actually do schedule-wise because I'm sure it's going to be a successful event. It's just I think it's going to be a little interesting to see the results of what what happens there from the different greens and if they do switch them around at all because I really hope they don't and I really don't hope i guess that they don't play james garden safe for the round robin and then don't play the final there because that could be a pretty significant problem as well if you're the best player on the artificial green and then suddenly you have to go over to the grass green for only the final or something like that i yeah there's there's lots of logistical challenges that i think is going to be tough for them to figure out over the next little while here like we said, though, I think it's tough to really uh, beat on the clubs too much. It's not their choice or anything. I think uh, it's an interesting decision by whoever at Bulls Canada makes those choices. Um, I really think the part that I dislike the most about the decision is just splitting it up, period. Because, like, the youth event, obviously, it's about competition and winning and all that fun stuff. But it's also, in my opinion, about building friendships and hanging out with people. And I think uh, just splitting that up kind of almost defeats the purpose of that. I remember, I'm sure you can attest to this too, Mike, but when you were competing in the under 18s, it was almost like the allure when the under 25 people came in and they were supposed to be these like big shot next team Canada people. So it was fun to, to get to watch them and kind of uh, hang out with those people. So I think it kind of sucks that they're taking that aspect away of it. If that's how they decide to do the split. Um, so I don't like that part of it, but I mean, again, it's tough when there's nobody that wants to host anything kind of interested to see um how the um the force line pairs that happens at the same time um if they're going to be combining both groups together where are they going to play that and uh it would be how is logistically that be? logistically tough unless they take it back to the old format where they don't run the events at the same time and space it out over the course of a full week right because you they, this would be a logistical nightmare trying to get people shuttle people all over the place at the end of the day because yeah, what is it right now is uh they play singles in the morning and then like, in, the afternoon? in the afternoon yeah yeah if i remember correctly depending on numbers i think it was you played your three rounds of singles in the morning and then one or two of the pairs in the afternoon but they're pretty quick games so and then again if i'm chiming in with my displeasure and just think about being a person who goes from a 12 second outdoor green and then they move you over to play the forester legs on a artificial so it's like again the, a a the tough thing for that too is if it's somebody like again mike i'm sure you can 
agree with me on this. Uh, back in the day, maybe we didn't care so much about the Forster Lang pairs, but there's some young kids out there who are putting everything they have into it. They just want to go home with the medal because maybe they're not doing so hot in the singles. And if you go out there and struggle, it's going to make you feel like a piece of garbage because you're so used to one surface. Tough. Yeah. Uh, it's going to be tough. Again, like not trying to be overly critical, but uh, it's going to be an interesting development. We'll have to definitely maybe give some coverage to that when it actually ends up happening once we sort of have the schedule maybe we can clarify and be a little more positive about the decision but good on them for taking it giving it their best because it's we need it to be hosted somewhere and someone's doing it so that's that's encouraging absolutely so i, I don't know if we have any other any other thing that we wanted to cover do you guys have anything else you wanted to talk about here uh, there is one thing we kind of missed on. We did want to talk about our goals and our uh, our right. year to date and our goals going forward. So I guess if we want to start back from the beginning, we started as a little podcast, me and Daryl. <laughs> we had some guests and we got some following and now we're here. We added Mike to the team. Um, I don't know what to look forward to going forward. I'd like to say I want to hit a wild number of subscribers, but I don't know what's realistic in our space um i think a thousand is pretty incredible as it is so i mean i don't know maybe you guys have a better idea on what you think a, a goal is it'll be interesting i i want to see how we do when bulls is actually back like uh, legitimately um not just kind of uh, hit and miss stuff like you know we have commonwealth games and world bulls and we have the nationals being played and provincial champions and we have uh, big tournaments like um, a WOBA and the U.S. Open and and um, Australian Open um, at hopefully full capacity, just um, giving us a whole bunch of stuff to talk about and new players, uh, you know, breaking out and and making a name for themselves, that kind of stuff. I think there's a lot of space for us to grow because we've been kind of uh, growing inside this bubble of. Um, news about pandemic stuff and you know clubs opening and, and things like that um i think there's a lot of interesting things that we can do and um uh, to see where we can go yeah like I you guess guys we'll... pretty much started this podcast uh right before a pandemic started you've taken it from that to uh over a thousand subscribers in what two years now so i think as daryl's saying it's gonna be quite interesting what will happen when we have a full season of bulls have actual international events to cover because i know personally once we start having international events to cover i think we're gonna turn into almost a, a news type of network for the bulls i guess information that's going to be happening so like we'll be covering sort of results teams being selected things like that once we kind of have that ability to do things and i know coverage in canada wise we plan to maybe be at the nationals Get, get people interviews at the events things like that it's like we very much want to get in there be involved with the the events that we can be so it's hard to say what our goals are for the future but i think um as luke liked to say earlier in our meeting to the moon is sort of <laughs> where we want to go with this so we'll see what happens there down the line <laughs> maybe about a, a year from now we can maybe look back and see where we're at and then kind of assess from there I think you uh, pretty much hit the nail on the head for me too, Mike. I know I've talked about it in the past and I know um, I've never wanted to just be known as the Canadian Bowler podcast. I wanted to be known more as like a media outlet, media store sort of deal um, with news, uh, comedy shows, uh, little skits, whatever. I think um, we want to be more than just a podcast. We want to be uh, kind of a place where people can come and learn, have some fun and just, uh, I don't know, be entertained, I suppose, is probably the best way to put that out there. Um, obviously, the podcast is great. It's probably my favorite part of what we have going on right now. Um, and I think going forward, it's always going to be a staple. Um, but I think it would be really, really cool if eventually, if uh, we build up enough uh, stuff, if we could uh, stream better and maybe travel to some big event somewhere, I think that'd be really awesome. I guess we kind of have, I don't know how much you're allowed to do, Daryl, but I think it's neat having you as a national team coach. We might be able to get some inside scoop and some, some inside looks on maybe how a training camp rolls out and everything else. I think that would be fun. Um, so yeah, I think my goal going forward is just expanding our, our, uh, sort of like our repertoire of shows and um, just 
just content coming down the line, I guess. Yeah, I think there's a lot of opportunity for, um, I guess we could call it like um, vlogs or like, you know, the virtual logs of like a diary. Yeah. So if I'm going to go to a big event and travel, you know, from you know when I leave to when I get there to training camp to, you know, coming home after the event is done, having a, a diary um, on some of our social media pages or something like that of, of what went on it would be really cool. And it's something that we don't do currently. Um, yeah. So there's know, lots of cool stuff we can do. I know we've talked about doing stuff like that in the past and obviously um, things got squashed when events didn't happen. Um, but I, it's also just cool just to have those memories because once they're posted online, they're out there for everybody to see forever. Yeah. So it's almost just like a personal catalog. Like you could show, like you guys have young kids, you could show them all these cool <laughs> things you got to do and something that you enjoy doing, right? So. Yeah, it's pretty exciting to think forward to stuff like that. Be great once we get a normal year to all get together too, because three of us haven't seen one another together and what probably six years i think when we went to a blue jays game together six years ago or so so it's been it, a long it, time it's it's been a while and Is it, it that be nice long to, ago it's got to be pretty close to about six years i think because it would have been whenever nationals were in toronto so no we went to the blue jays game and we went to wales four years oh yeah i guess you're right yeah that would have been four years ago now though still yeah still a long time ago yeah but it'll be oh, nice to Darryl, get together. Daryl's got a new car since then. Le less <laughs> dense. No, yeah, less dense. No Toronto dense. <laughs> you know, Daryl's car got a dent. If you don't know the story, he got a dent in his car when we went to that baseball game. And it was just yeah, within a month we made... of me buying that car too. Just ding, boom. And bas basically, what happened was me and Mike met up, and me and Mike have sort of a. I don't know. At the time, it was sort of like a uh, I don't even know what to call it. Everyone thought we were alcoholics, basically. <laughs> and uh, we kind of lived up to our name a little bit. And Mike came in and we were way too hungover to drive the next morning. So I called Daryl and be like, you got to pick us up at our hotel because we're not going to be able to drive downtown Toronto. And then he got a dent in his car. It was a good time. <laughs> well, I can tell you guys, uh, we set the goal of a thousand. We hit it. Um, we still have a little bit of time to go. But um, for all of our fans out there for everybody that's liked subscribed and is still watching our show um there's a lot more to come um we've only scratched the surface of the videos we're creating with the delivery series and then with mike series coming down we we haven't even scratched the surface of live interviews and talking to people and going to events we did the streaming of the phoenix which was kind of that test uh this year to see if we could actually do it and i think we can and uh the goal for where our sub count goes, for where this channel goes, um, we'll probably discuss over the winter um, when we have a little more time and, and things aren't as hectic as they are now, hopefully. And um, we'll have new goals for 2022. Yep, uh, I think that's a pretty good way to put it. I do just want to mention again, we're probably going to do something similar like we did last fall, last winter, where we'll probably have another couple shows here for the next uh, month or so. And then when we get a little closer to Christmas, we'll probably ramp down. Uh, take some time off to kind of recuperate, spend time with family over the holidays and whatnot. And then we'll be back stronger than ever and the start of next year um, with some big name guests, hopefully, and uh, on the podcast and some new content for you guys to watch. Um, I guess, yeah, I'll say it again. Thanks, guys, for the 1,000. We appreciate it so much. Uh, if you haven't already, don't forget to hit that subscribe button down there, like, comment, share it with all your friends. Uh, maybe if we hit... Uh, 2000 by the end of next year Michael shave his beard off on the podcast <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding who knows but maybe you never know um, so that'd be fun uh, alright guys I guess that's it for today I'll wrap it up here uh, great show today guys sorry my headphones exploded <laughs> um, thanks again for the 1000 uh, I guess all 1000 of you and beyond I hope all your bowls are touchers until next time guys we'll see ya <laughs>